Okay, so I can't tell if this is a uh, vending machine one, but someone may have lost a rose gold Kendra Scott ring that looks like it has diamonds. Could be real, could be not. It's definitely a tiny <laughs> finger. It does not fit on my pinky, and my wife's ring does. So whoever may have lost a rose gold, what looks like band. It, very small. Anthony. Anthony, you lost he it. Knows he lost it. Is this Percy's? <laughs> okay. okay. It's John's pinky toe ring. I'm going to... Oh, dude, that's exactly what that could be. It's playing for cheese. rolling it all over my fingers. Toe cheese? Is that gross? <laughs> Who's had a good time so far? Alright, I didn't really answer my question. I'll take those as me. Okay, cool. Everyone's having a good time. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Who, uh, who is sitting with their small group right now? Someone more in the front. Yeah. Okay, I've got two books. Hopefully many of you have read. The Hiding Place. Yeah, they go together, so I'm looking for a small group to give it to, so it stays in your group. So we read one, pass it around, read the other one.
baptisms. Yeah. Repentance is when we turn away from the life that we're living, sin, selfishness, and we turn the other way, and we're now walking with Jesus. And we are baptized, and we're made new, made into a new creation, and Jesus did it in obedience to the Father, and it's a sign for us as believers to do as well. And so if this is something that you feel like might be for you tomorrow, talk to your small group leader if you have any questions. Um, and if they can't answer your questions, they'll find someone else, they'll find someone else. We'll get your questions answered. But it's something for us as believers, a privilege and a joy that we get to do what Jesus did and be baptized into a life with him. And so sign-ups are all on the website. That awesome website that has everything on there. Sign-ups are there. We'd love to celebrate that with you tomorrow right after service. Is that correct? Yeah, right after yeah, morning service. And it'll be right in between when the first 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. services are going to be transitioning in and out. So not only is there going to be 350 students here to celebrate with you, but church people that didn't even realize that they're going to be celebrating new life tomorrow. So come on. And if you are concerned about that liquid statistic, we will have experienced baptizers on hand if you need them. Eli, just kidding. Anyways, other than that, the other thing about tomorrow is make sure that before service you check out in your hotel. I don't know if there's really a checkout process. Is there a checkout process? Look at me. Normally, I never check out. I just leave, and that's usually fine, um, unless I get a charge that I didn't know about. But uh, just check out. Maybe take your cards up front. And make sure there's nothing that else that needs to be done. Uh, check out beforehand. And because there is church tomorrow, try to only park in the big dirt parking lot across the road directly behind you guys. Cool. Yeah. The one that we pretty much haven't needed to park in, but that's where we should park so that all the people coming to church can have regular spots. I don't know. Who is or isn't upset if they have a spot that they reserve mentally and they're not going to like us. So, you know, be gracious with uh, people who've had spot for 60 years. We don't know. And so either way, with that being said, we still have another great, great evening and also a great, great morning tomorrow with Eli and Mary Gotro. So can you please welcome them up and we'll get some time. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11 says, Who is like you among the gods, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, and working wonders? And we're going to fast forward 700 years to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Fast forward another 300 years to the end of the Old Testament, and we're in the book of Malachi. And now the Lord is talking to his people, and he says, But you say, What a weariness this is. And you sniff at it contemptuously. You say, What a burden this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. Lord, we pray that you'd help us tonight to continue to chase after you with all of our heart, to see you as you really are and all of your awesomeness and your splendor and your majesty. Lord, help us to never be those who would say, what a dreariness, what a bore this is, what a burden this is. But we are together in your presence, holy God. And we remember, Lord Jesus, that your name is wonderful. Everybody said amen. 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 Go ahead and have a seat. Boy, we've had, a, we've had a good time so far. Guys, if you recall, just want to want to make sure we're on the same page. Where we were last night, we were talking about not dropping prematurely out of this race of life, running with God, but continuing all the way on and knowing God and becoming 
victors, becoming overcomers, those people who become what God intended when he created us, to have that character formation inside of us that would cause him to give us that white stone with a new name on it, known only to him who receives it, Revelation 2.17. This morning we kind of transitioned a little bit. We started talking about, okay, well, how do we do that? And we talked about you have to have a foundation, right? You have to have... Uh, those two legs to stand on. We don't want to be that pushover Christian that's trying to stand only on the leg of experience or only on the leg of truth, but we need to have both. And this morning we focused on truth is a person named Jesus, and the revelation of who Jesus is is the Scripture. And Jesus is actually on every page of the Bible. Isn't that cool? Mary led us down that path. So, But we want to be two legs. We want to be people both of the truth, of the scripture, but also people of the spirit. Right. And we do want to experience God. We want to see the rabbit, if you remember Friday night. We want to actually know who God is and run after God with all of our hearts. So just setting this up for tonight, this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to run after God. How many you want to, you want to run after God tonight? So we're going, to, we're going to do a little teaching, preaching up front, and then we're going to invite the worship team, and we're just going to seek the Lord together. For an extended amount of time tonight, and then we have actually a fiesta outside, and we're going to celebrate uh, God's goodness and bounty with some Mexican food tonight. And it's a real deal. This is uh, these are ladies from the church that are cooking for us, so you're going to get the real thing. So let's just start this way as we um, kind of get into tonight. Mary's going to come up in just a second, and um, I, I, that's a total lie. It's not going to be just a second. We'll be a, few, a few minutes to be up here. Let's be honest about this, shall we? When's the last time you saw something that took your breath away? Something that, that actually made you, maybe even out loud, say, wow, or that that filled your heart with wonder. That made you think, how did they, how did they even do that? I, I didn't even know that was possible. Something that really created wonder in your heart. I mentioned uh, on last night that I spent some time in the mountains recently in Montana. And at one point, we were, we were calling a bull elk, a six by six bull elk in. And we have a fake bugle, and he's got a real bugle. I don't know if you've heard an elk bugle, but it's, if, you're, if you're within 50 yards in the woods of a true bugle from a big bull elk, it's wild, man. It's like this guttural thing that only, you know, you, you just, it's really hard to replicate that, at least for me. Some guys are pretty good at it. But I'm, I'm down in camo, like as low as I can get out of the wind, and I'm watching this guy, and I mean, he's just giant, giant rack, and he's walking in 15 yards from me. And I'm looking up at him, and I'm, I'm just thinking, don't breathe, don't breathe, don't stink. <laughs> and I watch him for about 20 seconds come in. And he, he's just the most majestic animal. You're looking at this thing, and you're looking up at him, and he's making these noises, and you're just thinking, wow. I mean, it just totally fills your heart with wonder. And um, it actually, he, He's still out there running around, <laughs> for those of you who are wondering. But it was a fantastic, just incredible moment of wonder. I'm thinking about Mary and I were, um, not too long ago, we went to uh, see a friend perform this uh, music conservatory thing. And I'm not really a musician, but um, this, this young lady came out and played a piece on the piano that, uh, you know, I, I don't really know that much about music, but... <laughs> She moved me. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, I felt something inside when she played that I almost started crying. <laughs> like, what is happening to me? She's like, she's like, you know, Pied Piper thing. She's doing something to me that's not supposed to happen right now. It was so profound. And then I found out that it wasn't that she was playing some other piece. It was her own piece that she had written. This young lady was from Brazil. And then I found out that she was 14. <laughs> how do you, like, how do you do that? Like, I'm talking about stuff that fills your heart with wonder, that just kind of makes you say, wow, I remember being at the uh, SHOT Show in Vegas, I don't know if you're familiar with Shooting Honey Outdoor Trade Show, and we're looking through thermal imaging goggles that look through walls. 
you, and you, like you can see through walls and see what's going on inside, you know, and I'm thinking this is incredible. Right. And you know, maybe maybe you sense that when you're out in nature. I I probably more than any time I sensed that when I was when I witnessed the birth of my children. And and, and you see the, the person that you love is, is is actually giving birth to this human being that's kind of the pinnacle of God's creation. And, and you're watching this thing happen and you, you know, you're like dying and fainting and all that kind of. But you're, you're, you're saying, wow, this is amazing. By the way, some of you have parents who are not believers. And that was actually the thing from my, my stepdad, my adopted dad. I, I call him my dad because my name Gotro is, a, is an adopted name. He adopted me. And um, he, he was the youngest of his family. By 10 years, he had never been around, you know, siblings who were babies or anything like that. And then he came into my life when I was already, a, you know, a kid. I was six years old when he came in. He'd never really seen a baby. He didn't believe in God at all. In fact, when I got saved and tried to witness to him, he told me, son, you're welcome in this house, but you don't speak about that stuff. You take that religion stuff somewhere else. If, you, if you're going to bring that in, you're not welcome in this house if you're going to talk that way. And Mary and I prayed for, for so long. And in the meantime, my, my mom ended up getting saved, and, and man, I, I've never known anybody, I'm not going to tell you this whole story, but I, I've never seen anybody more radically transformed when, you remember yesterday we said you must be born again, if you're going to go to heaven, my mom was born again, and the angst and the bitterness in my mom's heart was gone, and there was joy and love, and, and my dad, my stepdad, was, he saw that in his wife, blew his mind, and then he actually held his grandbaby, our, our daughter, he saw new life spiritually in his wife and new life physically in his granddaughter. And he said, I'm, I'm an idiot to try to pretend like there's not a God. I know there's a God and I need to get right with God. I got, to actually, I got to baptize, I got the water baptized both my mom and my dad. Some of you are praying for your parents and your, your siblings. Don't quit praying for them. You keep loving, you keep serving. And you, you keep sharing the, the love of Jesus with them. And you see what God does. But that, with the point I'm making is that sort of thing fills your heart with wonder. And the Bible teaches that wonder is actually part of the Christian experience. In fact, the name of Jesus, his name, the prophet said, shall be called Wonderful. And we see these things around us that take our breath away. And it is supposed to remind us of who God is. These are, these are reflections of the character of God. The creation that we see, the abilities and talents and people that he's made, all of this is supposed to make us think of God. C.S. Lewis said it this way, it's not the physical objects, but it's that indescribable something of which for a moment they become the messengers. We want, he said, we want something more. It's hard to put it into words, but we, when we see beautiful things, when we see awesome things, we... There's something in us that wants to step into it, to partake of it, to participate, participate with it, to enter into it. And, and that's God's invitation into his presence, you see. But for so many of us, have you ever recognized the propensity to lose the wonder? <laughs> to become bored with things that used to thrill you? We have this propensity to take things for granted. And we become so familiar with them, they don't take our breath away any, anymore. And they're, I'm thinking of things that, you know, we just take for granted that our great grandparents would have freaked out about, like a combustion engine, for example. I, um, last week was in a brand new Corvette. And of course, this would only be legal in a controlled environment. But, that Corvette's ability to go from 60 to 160 was amazing. <laughs> take your breath away. And we take things like that for granted when our great great grandparents, maybe for you guys, would have that would have freaked them out. It would have blown their mind that they didn't have to ride a horse or walk. But we just like, yeah, yeah, we got a car. I'm thinking of cell phones like Mary and I did. My first cell phone was a back phone. You don't even know what that is. But you actually had it, it was about that big, and you like plugged it into your car and you like took it around with you. It was awesome. And it was amazing to me. And now, you know, they're in our pockets. And even in an airplane, for crying out loud, like you, 
Uh, we're going to get on a plane and go to Saudi Arabia next month. Saudi Arabia, we're going to get on a plane. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah thank you. <laughs> or, like, things that just blow your mind that you've got to be grateful for. Like, like skinny jeans that actually stretch. <laughs> Do you remember when there was no elastic in pants? Thank God. The problem is, we can lose the wonder. We can lose the awe. And here's the thing. The older you get, the more it takes to fill your heart with wonder. This is just the way God made us. The older you get, the more it takes to fill your heart with wonder. I don't know if you ever went to uh, Disney as a kid, like as a little kid, and it was like the most amazing thing. There's like this castle and these giant, you know, goofy and Cinderella people that are like, ah, they're amazing. And then you go back as like a teenager and like, man, this is all right. This is not that great. Or elementary school, did you ever do that? Like you went to elementary school, you ever go back as an adult? It's like the lockers are down here. If you go in the bathroom, it's like the toilets are like, like this place was giant when I was a kid, right? You see, the older you get, the more it takes to fill your heart with wonder. When, when you tell bedtime stories to your kids, it's kind of like this, you know, you have a two-year-old, four-year-old, and six-year-old. This, you know, the, the six-year-old, you got to tell them a story about, you know, Little Tommy went to bed and he heard a knock at the door in the middle of the night. And so he got up and walked across the floor and he opened the door and there was a dragon and he pulled out his sword. And for a six year old, that's like pretty cool, right? For a four year old, you don't, you don't have to even use a dragon. It's like, well, Tommy was in bed, he heard a knock at the door in the middle of the night and he got up and, and walked across the floor. It's like, oh, what's going to be on this other door? The two year old, he's like, well, Tommy was in bed and he heard something. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? The older you get, the more it takes to fill your heart with wonder. And here's what you need to understand. Only God is big enough to perpetually fill your heart with wonder. Everything in this world is going to leave you wanting more eventually. Only God is big enough. That desire in you is to seek after God. But here's the problem. I started with these three stories. And Mary, if you get ready to come on up. Here's the problem with the history of the people of God. It started way back, we started in Exodus with the deliverance of God's people from slavery in Egypt. God told Moses, he says, I'm going to show my wonders. I'm going to reveal how awesome I am. And he did just that, if you know the story. <laughs> the plagues of Egypt were incredible, and it culminated with the parting of the Red Sea. God parted the ocean, the sea, he parted it, and a few million people walked through on dry ground. It was so amazing. They got to the other side and Miriam pulled out her tambourine and they started singing and dancing and praising the wonders of God. But then the years went by and then the decades and then the centuries. And by Malachi's day, the priests, a thousand years later, the ones who were supposed to know God and represent him, the priests, they said, what a drudgery all this is. What a bore this is. What a burden all this is. You guys welcome here. And thinking, what if 
this is real? What if this is true? Imagine if there was really a savior that would come and help us, right? Can you, I mean, put yourself there. We're, we're sitting here in these wonderful chairs in this wonderful building looking back, knowing he really did come. <laughs> he really did come. Jesus really did come. Yeah. And he shook everything up. He, ch he changed the world. One of my favorite things, kind of, I'm not actually technically in academia, but we've worked with college students for 100 years, and so I feel like we're a part of it. We're a part of it. And one of my favorite things that is relatively recent, you guys might not know that this is a thing, but in most of your textbooks, it will say something like the year 500 BCE, right? Yeah. Or it will say the year 1300, whatever they call it, A-C-E, whatever it is. But um, you know what the, the, the actual thing that they're saying, they're trying to say that the whole world does not divide upon the birth of Jesus Christ. Because the old way of saying it was BC, before Christ, or AD, in the year of our Lord. But I just love it, because no matter what you call it, the whole world divides on the birth of Jesus. I mean, we can't get away from it. He changed the world. He changed the world. Listen to this. We are so jaded. You have a phone that is full of the most amazing things that anybody's ever seen, and now you're like, eh, that doesn't look very real. But listen to me. Jesus came, and he had the most wonderful words that anyone had ever heard. He said things like this. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. And you know what? He meant it, and you know what? He delivered. <laughs> he said this. He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. He said that and he meant it. Yeah, and it was real. He said this. He, Jesus said this. I am the resurrection and the life. Yeah. The one who the one who believes in me will live. Yeah. Even though they die. We are hearing this and we're like, mm, I heard that. This is revolutionary. Yeah. Are you hearing what Jesus said? Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus' words were wonderful. People heard him speaking and said, who is this? No one has ever talked like this before. And it was true. It's still true. There's nobody like him. He did wonderful works. Think about what he did. We hear these stories, they go in one ear and out the other. We've heard it so many times, we're kind of, I hope some of you are hearing these stories of Jesus for the first time and hearing them with fresh ears. <laughs> because it's incredible what he did. He healed the sick everywhere he went. Sick people who'd been sick their entire life came to him and walked away well. He came to people who had never seen, ever, were blind their whole life, and they walked away from Jesus seeing perfectly. This, this should shock us. This should change us. This should shake us. He raised the dead. <laughs> Jesus Christ raised dead people back to life. He cast out demons. He came upon people who were horribly afflicted by demonic spirits. We're, we're all 2021 and we think that's not real. It's very real. And Jesus came to people who were afflicted. Do you remember in the Bible there was a story about this poor father that has a son who is trying to kill himself all the time. This, I don't know how old the son was, but this father is just at the end of his rope. He's exasperated. His son tries to throw himself into a fire. Whenever there's a fire, his son tries to drown himself whenever there's water available. And he comes to Jesus, and Jesus delivers the kid. He delivers people. He fed the hungry. There were thousands of people gathered one day, in the Bible, it says about 5,000 men, and it doesn't even count the women and children. And when we come, I mean, we add some numbers, right? When we bring the women folk and the kids. There were thousands and thousands of people. And this one little kid brings his lunch. <laughs> right? That one little kid who shared his lunch, and Jesus fed everyone with that little lunch. And there was plenty left over. Jesus is amazing. <laughs> He changed water into wine. I mean, that, that, we hear that and we're like, hmm, but that's actually amazing. I can't do that, can you? He, listen to me, 
Jesus restored hope yeah. Yeah. and purpose and life to broken people. Right. We read the Bible and we think we can't really relate to the people that lived way back then. But we can because they were people <laughs> just like us and they were hopeless and they were purposeless and they were broken and Jesus came and changed everything in their heart. That's right. Ultimately his greatest work was this, the cross. Not just the cross, but his resurrection. He gave his life, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. It's, it's almost silly to even try to say that. The words don't do it justice. Jesus defeated death and hell and the grave. He was resurrected. He lives again. He ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and that isn't even it. If that wasn't enough, he sent the Holy Spirit so that we can be filled with him all the time. The Spirit of Jesus is with each of us as we ask him to be. He gives us, listen to me, he gives us the power not to sin. Right? Thank you, Jesus. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. He gives us power to be a witness. We can't do any of these things without him. Jesus is amazing. And still, that was 2,000 years ago. Now guess what's happened? You've seen it. Some of you might even still feel it. Have we come here tonight with expectancy in our hearts? In a little bit, in a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to meet with God. <laughs> have you come here tonight thinking that Jesus is actually here? Yeah. Or have you just come? 2,000 years later, here we are again. So few people in this generation stand up and speak about Jesus with any sense of wonder or awe. We've, we've lost it. We're not impressed. The words that we all use and the very tone of our voices betray what's going on in our hearts. We're full of doubt and we're full of fear. We to believe that God is not big enough to help us. Hear me. We live lives full of anxiety and of fear and of doubt. There's no light in our eyes. There's no fire in our hearts. There's no faith in our words or our deeds. Our Christianity is sort of an add-on to the rest of our lives. We're busy. We've got stuff going on. We've got our families. We've got our school. We've got work. We've got all these things that we do. And, and then we tap on Jesus sometimes at the end. We're feeling a lot like those priests in Malachi's day. What a drudgery. What a burden. Why should we even bother with all of this? God isn't who we thought he was. It's getting close, isn't it? But listen to this. Jesus said this in Matthew 13. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Some of you have already heard this this week, and I think that's me. <laughs> Hear this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, the treasure, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went and sold all he had to buy that field. He knew that the treasure was worth more than anything he'd ever, ever dreamed of having. I had this boyfriend in college. Helen, come back. I had this boyfriend in college. He was incredibly handsome. He was incredibly smart. Like, I remember when we were freshmen, and people were taking those kind of entry-level classes, and you're all holding your breath, hoping that everyone makes an 80, right? So that the curve is set by, the, by that grade. But this person that I was dating, he always made a 99, and everybody was so mad, like, <laughs> he was very smart. He um, excelled as an athlete really, really good. He had tons of friends. Everybody loved him. Never lacking for 
friendship. Still, as good as all of those things were, not any of it could lift the burden of sin and selfishness off of his back. None of it. None of those things. None of it could fill that deep void of needing significance and purpose. None of it. None of those things that we could spend our lives hoping for, aiming for, working for, none of those things could fill him with joy or hope or peace. But do you know who could do all of those things? And who did do all of those things? This, this is our story. I'm talking about Eli. And I was with him. One day he got a letter in the mail. And it was an invitation. See, he was on the water polo team. <clears throat> and it was an invitation to come and be a part of the national team. The U.S. national team. Which is a pretty much the Olympic team in non-Olympic years. So this thing that we've been working for our whole life, like giving ourselves to our whole life, this thing comes in the mail. Basically, you're in. All I had to do was go to this tryout thing. But he, he played, he started on the team ahead of a couple guys that were already on that team. I mean, it was a shoe-in thing. But we're talking about the treasure of the field tonight. The letter came a little too late. The wardrobe door had already opened. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus had already come in. <laughs> and no letter, no invitation, no position, no amount of money. The, uh, the feeling that he felt, that we both felt, when Jesus comes in and changes your life forever. Lifts that burden off of your back, that pack that none of us can carry, that squishes us, smashes us, and takes the life out of us. That burden of sin, gone. Some of you have felt this, and you know what I'm talking about. Jesus is the treasure in the field. Jesus is everything. He's every single thing in the Bible. He's so much greater than any of us can grasp. We, we actually wonder, we go through life wondering, can anyone help us? <laughs> can anyone save us? We love those goofy Superman movies, or whatever they're called, superhero movies, because we want somebody to come and save us. We like that. It resonates with something deep in our heart. Surely there is someone who can come and help us. Jesus alone can bring help and hope and forgiveness. Jesus alone can bring peace and joy and contentment. We've been looking in all the wrong places for all of these things. Would you stand with us? We're talking this weekend about really walking with God. Not just for a little while, not just kind of test it out and see how it goes. I mean, we're talking about walking with God all of our lives yes. so that we can begin walking with God forever. Okay. Forever. He made you with a beautiful purpose and plan. You're, you're not an accident. God made you. And he wants to spend forever with you. He's not trying to keep you away. He's not trying to push you away. He's doing everything that he can to bring you close to him. He wants to spend forever with you. He sent his son. Jesus came and left glory to come here so that we can be reconciled to God. God is doing everything that he can to bring you close to him. That's how crazy he is about you. He loves you. We're looking all over the place in everything we can find, anything we can lay our hands on, trying to help ourselves feel alive. We're carrying burdens on our back. The burden of sin, every one of us carries that. 
There's nothing we can do to get rid of it. But Jesus has come. His name is wonderful. And he's come and he is here tonight. Have you come here expecting God to touch your life? In just a minute, we're going to start to worship and we're going to pray. And I, I want to ask you, if you have never made a relationship in your life with Jesus, if you have never come to him, if you've never been born again, we said that earlier, it's scriptural, you've got to be born again. What does that mean? It means that we lay our lives down at the feet of Jesus and say, God, I can't, I can't do this. You be the Lord of my life. You be my Savior. Please, Jesus. That's all it means. And so many of us in this room can testify to the fact that that's not just a little bit of words that we say into the air. <laughs> when you pray that prayer and mean it, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, will come into your heart and change you forever. It's not just words. You don't have to try to hype yourself up. You don't have to try to feel the right feeling. <laughs> you might feel a lot of feelings. You might feel nothing at all. But Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, will come into your heart and change you forever. That's going to be our first response. Second response is this. Some of us are carrying some heavy, heavy things. You, you might already be a Christian. This is who I'm talking to now. You believe in Jesus. He's changed your life. Yet you're still carrying things. Think of the... Who was talking earlier about a 70-pound pack? Somebody was talking about that. Carrying a 70-pound pack? Right? That was you. Imagine that. That's what we're carrying spiritually. We've got bitterness in our hearts. We're, we, we don't want to forgive somebody that's hurt us. And, and what it's doing is it's just hurting us even more. We've got to lay these things down. We're carrying such fear and such anxiety. We, we are believing the lie that God's not big enough. We've got to lay that down. There's so many things that you might have carried in here. Have you come here believing that God can change your life? He can. Yes. He wants to. Right. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. We turn our eyes to you, God. Forgive us because we've become so jaded. Forgive us because we've believed the lies all around us that you're not enough, that you're not real, that it's just imagination. God, we pray that you give us hearts that seek after truth, that, that earnestly seek you. God, we've come in here and we've got so many things. Some people have sick bodies that need healing. God, some people have sick hearts that need mending. God, some people have sick minds that need clearing. Some of us just need you, Jesus, to save us. We've come here with all kinds of things and more than people because we remember what we read and what we know. You are God and you love us. If you would like. 
Let's pray together. You guys pray too. God, we love you. Lord Jesus, here we are. And this is such a new thing to so many of us, God. We don't even know what to say. But what we say is this. We believe that you're God. We believe that you're Lord. We believe that you're the Savior of mankind. Lord, we give you our hearts. And we ask, come in, Lord God. Come into our hearts, Jesus. Thank you. 